I'm Hanson Hossein, a former journalist. Hanson Hossein is an NBC News correspondent. Hi, Lester. Well, it's quite turned an amazing. filmmaker, turned educator. We're in this incredible time of disruption. And now the director of the Communication Leadership Graduate Program at the University of Washington in Seattle. In our program, we recognize Seattle as a storytelling capital of the 21st century. So in this season of Four Peaks, I'm setting out to connect with the business and creative leaders at the forefront of using storytelling to tackle today's biggest challenges. Join me on this ride. This is Four Peaks. On today's show, I'm joined by Chase Jarvis, a photographer famous for taking pictures of famous people and an entrepreneur who's launched a number of successful businesses. With Creative Live, he seeks to disrupt education, offering online classes taught by some of the world's greatest experts in their craft. So I thought it would be fun to bring him to campus and see how he does within the more traditional walls of higher ed. Chase, man, to see you. Thanks for coming. Pleasure, let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. Thank you very uh, know much for riding your bike all the way from Yeah, well, you know, that's part, that's part of, uh, we kind of sort of want to bring Seattle into the whole story and interviewing these influencers. And this time, you've been on our show before, but this time we actually want to tell the story of influencers who just happen to be based here in Seattle who have a national and global impact, and you're one of them. Thank you very much. And so as I, I love the 206. Yeah, so exactly. It's I know burned you, into my heart, man. Even though you have an office in Paris now, right? True. Well, actually, we <laughs> just stopped our office in Paris, but we're splitting time between Seattle and San Francisco now, oh, so I'm down good. there almost every week, but still deeply passionate about Seattle. So I'm a little nervous about this because you, in the time that you've started Creative Live, you have done some amazing things in alternative forms of education. And I, you know, we're here in the the exalted halls of higher ed, and sure. I feel like I brought the fox into the hen house. I feel a bit like it's you know, <laughs> a little so, itchy. No, no. It's all in good. fact, you know, we got our fabulous students here in our visual communication class, and we asked them to submit some questions, and one of them just said it perfectly. They wanted to ask, are we wasting our time? Should we all just drop out? Because you are creating this new model for higher ed, or education, lifelong learning. Sure. We have this remarkable graduate program, however, the two don't necessarily go hand in hand. So how do you perceive higher education based sure. on what you're doing? Uh, I also, I was so passionate about higher ed that I dropped out as well of a PhD program here at actually at the University of Washington in, in philosophy. And uh, I, wanna, I like to think of it as I wasn't walking away from something, I was walking to something else. And that was a career as an artist and an entrepreneur. And uh, the way I looked at school then is the same way I look at it now is it serves a purpose for a certain cross-section of people for a certain part of their life. And sure, you can talk about the, the jobs that actually require certification, and I want my surgeon to have passed the boards, and I want my you know airline pilot to be certified to fly oh, you don't want Airbus them to be crowdsourced education for Correct, surgery? Correct, yeah, okay. crowdsourced uh, <laughs> NASA astronauts yeah. is really not what I'm after. Uh, but, you know, and the same is true for me uh, and what I wanted to create. I was going to school because I was still discovering a lot about myself, trying to reconcile my past as a, a, an athlete and an artist, which when I grew up those things were very, they were like oil and water, they were at opposite ends of the spectrum, trying to reconcile that, which uh, with a reasonably intellectual brain, I mean my, my background, as I said, was in philosophy and, and my wife jokes about you, you were a philosopher because you didn't there was nothing else that you were good at, and, and you know, we, we jest about that. But you know, there is a sort of core part of going to school and putting yourself in the environment when you're still, when you're not actually sure what you want to do. That's so powerful. It's an environment that I really genuinely love. I sort of got like a really cool feeling actually coming on campus tonight to see just all kinds of foot traffic and a lot of young people getting together. To me, that's actually very inspiring, and I'm trying to with Creative Live and my life's mission, specifically around creativity, is I'm trying to tap into that same vibe, that same energy. And it's not an, necessarily an energy of time of life, but of learning. Yeah. And you know that's so much of what it means to be um, human, the, the capacity to learn and to build things and build tools. And that's actually one of the things that I'm, it's core to my mission to inspire other people to do and, and to do myself. So I don't look at them as necessarily antithetical. I think they have a place together, 
Um, that being said, I am trying to disrupt that and force this, you know, these institutions um, to realize what the future holds and, and think a little bit differently about how to prepare you know, students like these and others for the next chapter because it's going to be very different than the one we're in. Currently. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, the premise to our program is that we are in this historic time of chaos and disruption. And so the, f the first competence that you need to develop to actually prepare yourself and to lead in this new world is, frankly, creativity. For sure. And in fact, you have gone out as far as saying that in your South by Southwest talk, yeah, creativity is the new literacy. It is. So is it really just being able to come up with things out of the ether to take on these challenges that didn't exist before? Well, uh, you know, the, I think the fundamental definition of creativity at its most simple level is taking two things that you might have thought weren't combinable and putting them together to make something, and ideally that something is new and useful. Um, and so if you think of it in terms of that description, well, creativity is literally all around us. It's, you know, someone had to think about this cup, this jar, everything around us was created first in someone's mind, then there was a sketch or a a, a prototype, then there was a thing before it became sort of real. So I'm, I'm interested in pursuing creativity because that it, it unlocks, it is the thing that unlocks human potential, it locks all, all of our problems, our, our, the solution to them is based in some way, shape or form in creativity. I personally lead with art, I lead with photography, design, video, music, audio. But that's really a subset of creativity as a whole. So I think when we talk about creativity here in the show and you know, later with the students, um, I think we, we need to keep that in mind. I'm talking about it specifically in the daily practice of creating something, and that's most easily done with a picture on your iPhone or as a professional in a creative capacity that you think of. But what I'm really, the underpinning of this is creativity with a capital C, where Mechanical engineering is creativity, or, or, or the, uh, the wheel is mechanical engineering plus creativity coming together, or the electricity is electrical engineering and creativity coming together. So let's keep it in the big C when we're talking about it's that much, kind of stuff. In fact, yeah, just looking at your South by Southwest talk. Martin Luther King's approach Martin to Luther human King. rights. You're talking about creativity, and really big C creativity, creativity yes. aren't you? So let's look at some other things that I consider to be incredibly creative. Martin Luther King's approach to human rights, incredibly creative. Felix Baumgartner taking a pod up into the sky and jumping out of a balloon and doing something no one had ever been done in the history of man, incredibly creative. Turning brick into a wheel, that's a creative process. That's creativity applied to mechanical engineering. The light bulb so, is creative. It seems kind of we didn't very plan that. Very obvious. Did you just have that queued up there? Or were you... I did have it queued up. Oh, wow. I, nice. I actually <laughs> watched your entire talk. Right. Um, but it, it seems so obvious. Yeah. Why now? Why creativity now? Why not 20 years ago? Sure. I think it's the new literacy because it's, it's finally... Um, actually, let me restate that. I don't know why now, but I know now is now. Okay. And I can't really... There's all kinds of probably leading indicators that I wasn't sort of aware of. I just knew that in what was going on in here was telling me that it was time for me to sort of um, put that foot forward that I've been, frankly, struggling with because, you know, creativity, that guy's so creative. That was, again, that was sort of... There was a lot of trepidation or that, that was synonymous for strange or different or weird. And I grew up in very, like, middle, lower middle class um, where being weird, like I didn't want to be weird more than anything in the world, I just wanted to sort of be normal. And so instead of pursuing very, my, from an early age, very, very creative, but I was like, okay, I'm, that's weird, and then I'm gonna be the captain of a football team because I don't have to, you know, then no one asks any questions. And I spent a lot of time reconciling that personally. So credibility versus creativity, because you thought being captain of the football team would give you more credibility uh, and normalize you, right? Sure, absolutely, yeah. but it was, it was a fear-based response, and I feel like I, I grew up with with reasonably considering, even though it was very middle class, privilege. Mm -hmm. um, even though I had upside down Nikes and Adidas with four stripes, my parents did everything they could. I never wanted for much. You know, certainly food and water, all that was just that was just provided for me. And if it was hard for me to become the thing that I wanted to do, which is pursue creativity, imagine for other folks who might be you know coming from a, a, a position of disadvantage to culturally or lower socioeconomic status or other countries or places in the world. Holy smoke. So here I am reconciling this stuff. And I'm not alone 
in the particular lies the universal. So there's so many people trying to reconcile this and it just started happening. I looked around, it's like, wow, the internet is changing the way people gather. Um, there are now, you know, if, you're, if you like to sew or do needlepoint on Tuesday nights and make pictures of dead presidents, there's a whole club for that, I'm sure, on the internet. Like whatever. You, I think it's exactly right. I think people call that cognitive surplus, that the idea is that 20 years ago when we had our spare time, yeah. all we could use it for was to go home and watch television. Yeah. And suddenly the internet and the way we connect to each other has actually opened up new opportunities for us to explore things that matter more to us and give us more control as well. You said it best. I should ask you the question because that's, <laughs> like, I don't know what it's called, but there's like, the zeitgeist is really what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah. I can feel it, you can smell it, and it started just occurring to me that this is a great time for sort of me to lean into the thing that I've always wanted to be. And I think, you know, developmentally, it was the right time for me to, to sort of step forward and say that, you know, I, this is really what I, I dropped out of medical school, so I didn't share that with yeah. you. No, you're, um, you're bail, bailed on a, on a PhD in philosophy, also stopped pursuing a career in professional soccer in order to become a photographer. Yeah. My poor parents, right? Like, <laughs> just like, oh. and, and ama but amazingly successful now. And you mentioned reconciliation a few times, and and you've also referred to yourself as an artist. And my question for you, I mean, I look at your work, and, and I saw this recently on your Facebook page. I just love this image. This is uh, you Going scaling the wall to get this picture, right? Repelling down, Repel actually. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I don't know the the terminology as well as you guys do. Um, sure. And then there's a picture of you know Serena Williams, which is just phenomenal. Um, and I. You know, I, I'm trying to figure out, you seem to also be balancing the creative, the artistic with the commercial. You're very successful, especially with the commercial. Sure. You're an entrepreneur as well. So how do you, how do you, where, where's, how do the, where, where's the self in you? Yeah, sure. what, what are you? Are you an artist? Are you an entrepreneur? Are you a commercial photographer? Well, I think that's, you know, it's appropriate that we're in an institution of higher learning right now. Uh, it's one of the things that with Creative Live, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that I'm trying to um, solve a problem that I don't think the modern, even the modern educational institutions are set to solve, which is if our parents had one job, we will have five, the next generation of students will have five jobs at the same time. Absolutely. You know, I think we are all hyphens now. Um, I used to describe myself as a photographer, and then it got confusing when I started making videos about my career in photography to sort of let people into what I considered the black box, which was a huge part of the early, early so internet. So really breaking down the fourth wall. Right? Yeah, breaking yeah. down the fourth wall. And then I started directing uh, television commercials. And so I was a photographer and a director, and then this behind the scenes person thing. And then I you know, started a couple of companies, and then I was an entrepreneur, and then it's like, I don't know what I am, and I think I'm not alone. Yeah. I'm trying to tell other people out there that um, whether or not I've had successes or failures, that I'm just like everyone else and that I don't know what to call myself, and I think that we don't have a name for it is not a reason not to pursue it. That's great. Uh, and in fact, if I looked at your the output that you put out more often than not on social media, it tends to be video, and it actually tends to be Chase Raw, which I love, just sort of this um, very unedited you know, moving picture from your iPhone. Here's the most recent Good morning. one. Good morning. Today is an awesome day. Stick with me and find out why. I told you it was gonna be an important day, here's why. I just got into work here at the Creative Life Studios in San Francisco. We are starting something today that anyone in the world can participate in it, and I'm talking to you, and it's a very, very simple, but very cool thing called 28 to make. What I, what I, what I, why I wanted to show this sure. is partly because of your style, your visual uh -huh. style with these videos, but also, yeah. again, back to creativity and 28 to make, you actually want to get people in the discipline to either make a habit or break a habit through this 28 days of doing something, right? 10,000 people have signed up to do that since we launched that yesterday. 24 hours. 24 hours, there's 10,000 people from 100 countries coming together to make projects every single day. So we're just sending out a little, uh, an email to anyone who signed up. And uh, well, it's probably about 12,000 by now because it was coming in about- And you're you know, assigning them on a daily basis to do something, Yeah, just right? for 28 days. And yeah. uh, the, the desire and the uh, what I've noticed is taking action, doing something instead of doing nothing or pontificating as always um, has been more powerful for me in my life. So that's what that little thing was about. And the style of video is very much in uh, I spent so much of my career making super polished stuff for Fortune 100 companies, for Nike, Apple, Adidas, Red Bull, all those brands that you named, and the huge budgets, big productions, and I sort of felt like it was pulling me further away from the real and the now and the just authenticity, 
I also realized on social, totally incidentally, when it first came out, just like taking pictures and and sharing, you know, you wanted to share the cool stuff that you're doing because I was trying to get people excited about being a photographer. That photographer wasn't, you know, you're taking just, you know, pictures for the nightly news or the newspaper, not to disparage that, but it was just a whole world. And so I was documenting, you know, working for these great brands with super fancy people and helicopters and yachts and all the things that you think about at the apex of that industry. And I realized that I was actually sort of manufacturing a persona Unintentionally, it had a lot of positives for me because it helped, you know, separate me from a lot of my peers. And you get paid well for those things too, right? Oh yeah, the, yeah. it's stupid money. It's yeah. it's just it's incredibly profitable, and I don't want to disparage making money as an artist because that's critical. Mm -hmm. But I realized that that was sort of manufacturing a personality. That I didn't, that I wasn't even ever trying to do that because there's plenty of days where I wake up and like I don't want to get out of bed. This is gonna be a terrible day, and so <laughs> I just didn't think that whining or whinging about that stuff and what was valuable, and I was trying to be aspirational and show other people what cool things were happening with, in photography. With the, with the chase of 15 years ago, being okay with wobbly cameras and lens flares and low resolution like you are now with the stuff you're putting out? I, I, I always wanted to have, I'm a gritty person, like my parents sort of instilled that into me. Uh, it's, I look at it as a positive, but I, so I can't say it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be that sort of texture to it, but what's more important to me is the immediacy and the authenticity of, like, I'm not looking at the mirror, I'm looking at my iPhone, and I want to get this out tomorrow. This style feels more authentic to me, the immediacy and the authenticity. And again, the, it's, I think it's where things are going rather than um, going in a different direction. So as we, we are sitting in a class on visual communication, if you had to sum up what you think, do you have a consistent visual style, whether it is the more authentic Chase Raw stuff versus the really highly produced Serena Williams photography? Is there something that says this is signature Chase no matter what medium you're using? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, I feel like the the thread is that there's a, a, it's grounded in reality. I don't usually create photographs or really complicated um, commercials or, or even short films that are not based in, in, in reality. So you're not going to stage it? Correct. I think there's a certain amount of staging, like, hey, can you do this again? But it's not going to be fantasy. So documentary style? Yeah, it's more of a documentary style. And like that picture of Serena, like sort of that's at one end because that's Serena. Like, we just stopped shooting her in the tennis court. I said, come over here and stand. I think I, I can get a great picture of you right now. Um, but it wasn't like we, we built some fabricated scene and put her in something on Mars. And it's just not my style. There yeah. are other directors who for that is well suited. Um, so there's that sort of stylized sense of, of being of real. And that probably translates well to the platforms we use today. People want that authenticity, they want that accessibility, right? Sure. I think, so yeah, you're accesses, a photographer yeah. and a creative, and a visual creator that's for our times. I, and again, I think I'm, I'm more lucked into that. I didn't say, I, how am I going to be relevant? Um, I'm learning more and more to pay attention to what's in here. We can get all kinds of cues and stuff from out there, but like representing, you know, the, the closest, if you can put zero distance between your authentic self and the art that you put out, that's sort of really pure. And, and those are the things that strike nerves, really, really powerful emotive images or films, um, but it, because there's that vulnerability, that rawness, that takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. So sometimes we stray from that, and or sometimes commercial requirements stray from, you know, pull us away from that. Um, but at the core, I feel like, how can we keep super close to that? And that's what resonates uh, culturally, not just right now, but I think um, in the future, it's going to continue to get to get more like that. So you are future facing. You 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 are a force for disruption in many ways. Um, one of the things we're looking at is that if this truly is the historic time of disruption and the fast paced changes that we're seeing that we can barely keep up with, and we can see this in our politics and everything else that's happening right now. Sure. Um, the problems are also more epic than ever before. It's not sure. small problems; it's big problems because we're seeing a massive shift in society. And so. What is that one wicked problem that Chase Drivers is truly engaged with right now? It's, it is creativity, and it is getting creativity to be, we, we throw around words like innovation, that's really awesome, but what is at the core of innovation? It's creativity. And what is creativity if it's being cut from our schools, if it's being removed from the dialogue? And this is, it's systematic, and it's unintentional, it's a byproduct of thinking about 
you know, global economics and all of the things that sort of dominate. They the want to monetize economy. everything. Sure, give it those a metric. words. Yeah, yeah, metrics, monetization, yeah. all that stuff, and and just look at the school system. Not to disparage, you know, the the system that I grew up in, but the the that was literally based on two things: the the nineteenth century factor, eight, the twentieth century factory, and the nineteenth century farm. That's literally what our school systems are based on. So industrial revolution and agrarian reform, essentially. Yeah, literally, right? we, we have summers off in, yep. in the school year so that we can work and the harvest, okay? That's one thing. And, you know, that's literally going back to the 1800s. And then the, the basically the industrial revolution, how that was treated, how, how uh, the school system came out of that was very much like a factory where you have a lot of widgets and you put them in one end. They all move through the system at the same pace and they get the same treatment, and then they come out with a certain sort of uh, list of characteristics, and ideally those characteristics are the same. Like a factory that made widely disparate things is not a very good factory, according to that model, and our schools are literally lifted and stamped from that. So if we have a desire to have this uh, extreme innovation and thinking and creativity and solve the world's biggest problems, again, not creativity with a small C like photography, painting, design, all that stuff, but creativity with the big ones, solving human rights issues, solving the lack of access to clean water, that is creativity with a capital C. And if we want that kind of innovation, we have to have a school system and an educational world that that is certainly as innovative as the problems that we want to solve. So you're trying to solve this wicked problem of creativity with a new school system. Or I wouldn't yeah. even you want to use the word system. I don't like, is that I don't what creative like school live is? or system. So what is creative? I mean, creative that's, live, <laughs> that's all right. I, totally, I don't like system either, but I do love school. Sure, I'm with you too. Uh, yeah. uh, but no, I think we actually don't mean, we don't use the word students or, or, or school very much. We actually talk about learning and learning yeah. community and we're collaborative in that way in our own program. But And so what are you ultimately trying to produce with creative live? Who do you want to be out there five or six years from now once they go through your system, school, community. I, I want to create a culture of doers, yeah. of makers, of creators. We are a champion for Creator. Creative Live is. Um, and we're trying to unlock the creative potential that exists with everyone. I'm, the, the idea that creativity is some gift is a total myth. Creativity is a habit. And anyone can, like there is creativity. It's literally one of the things that differentiates from other species on the planet is our ability to put unlikely things together to make new things, so things like tools, uh, and spaceships. So, like, we have it inside of all of us. So, first of all, acknowledge that. Second of all, provide a place where anyone in the world can learn, and we can do that at scale for free. So, Creative Live has a freemium model, which anyone in the world can come to and watch. Watch education from Pulitzer Prize winners, New York Times bestsellers, the best of the best in photography and video, art and design, music and audio, craft and the maker movement, and then what we call money and life, which is the ability to have a make a living and have a life in any of those other disciplines that I mentioned. So, so there is that fuck, there, there is that economic sense that you want to make sure that people can actually earn something from this as well. For right? sure. There yeah. it, you can ju you can you don't have to take any of the sort of the business and the money and life classes that tie into whatever your particular discipline is, but we want to provide that. That's a thing that art school doesn't have. That's only theory and they say good luck. <laughs> and you know the reality is most people go there wanting to do that professionally and if you're not armed with those skills like then you really have nothing and you, you 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 know sadly the average debt from student loans right now in our country at least is thirty five thousand two hundred dollars that's the average so that means for everyone who only owes ten grand there's someone who owes fifty and that's catastrophic failure of the system in my mind the sad thing is the government actually makes a lot of money yeah, on the us system. owing them loans so there's we're disincentivized to fix it I'm trying to create a system where access is the core value. Anyone in the world can come in and learn from this freemium. So Creative Live, there's 24 seven, there's classes in each of those disciplines. That's just on our schedule. You can watch what we want you to watch, but there's 1500 classes, more than 25,000 lessons from over a thousand of the world's top experts in each of those fields that you can buy and access at any time. So in terms, in the grand scheme of things, you've built this thing and it's gone very well. From the ground up, man, like I'm that's amazing. down like And that's, is it, digging is it going to replace this? Can it replace this? Do you want it to replace this? What are you looking for? Um, I do want to indict the system for the things in which it's weak. And by the system, I'm negatively, I said I don't like that word. Like this, that's the part of this that I don't like. But what we focus on is creating amazing opportunities, access to the world's best. Because, I mean, if you were literally in a dark room by yourself and you said the education system, what could it be like? I would want any person in the world to be able to connect with the best possible teacher 
and have that learning experience be as close to like you're sitting in the same room as possible on any subject. And I, I think it's a, it's a monumental achievement. So wicked problems require wicked solutions of wicked creativity. For sure. And so just to close us off with something that'll make the transition to having a conversation with our folks sitting behind us, what's the, what's the one thing that you do when you wake up in the morning that gets you into that creative mindset that gets you moving for the day so that you can create something that will help make things better out there? Actually, the first thought is I need to put my own oxygen mask on before assisting other passengers. You know that from that yes. airline speech? Yeah. So I literally, uh, you know, we talked about it before camera, I'm trying to take good care of myself because I think if I'm, um, you know, my best mentally, emotionally, physically, then I can be in service of others for the, you know, the most powerful way and the, for the longest period of time because I get a lot of joy from it. Chase Jarvis, a pleasure to see you again. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you so much Thanks. for having me. My colleague Anita Verna Crofts teaches a foundational class in leadership through the lens of creativity and narrative. Her final assignment, to solve a communication problem in a way that is both novel and useful. In the last session of each class, students present their projects to each other while Anita and I look on. Afterwards, the students vote to choose the most successful projects. This season on Four Peaks, we showcase the top vote-getters. My name is Joe Hunich, and my project is called Native Tacoma and it's a geocaching style tour of places around Tacoma that are historically significant to the indigenous people of the area. Joe came to us to Comlead from uh, an educational background. He had worked for years in classrooms down in Tacoma and some of the communities that he had worked most closely with were Native American communities down in Tacoma. For the last uh, four years, I've been working with middle school and high school kids in the public schools that have Native heritage. I'm not a Native myself, and through these last four years of this experience, I've learned a ton about Native culture and about some of the issues facing Native communities today. Joe was really clear that it was crucial that this tour, that the words, that the images be one that were from the community. I didn't want it to be my voice or like an outside historian telling the story. I want it to be the people telling the story. And so I met with um, some people in the Office of Historic Preservation. And uh, eventually what we want to do is, you know, create videos that have people from the tribe, you know, sharing, sharing these stories of these historic places. In its final form, anyone visiting Tacoma will be able to operate and, and, and experience the city in a new way and, uh, and honor the community that has the deepest and most historical roots in Tacoma through the inventive nature of being able to maneuver something on your phone. That's our show. Thanks for joining me on this ride. Come along next time as we continue to explore the intersection between creativity and story. For more, go to fourpeaks.org.